Giles, uh, Executive Consultant, Industry Analyst at Tech Research Asia. Um, I have to start, as I have with every episode, uh, every every recording today, by asking what IT Nation means to you. Uh, for me, I don't think there's anything better than connecting with the channel community. I mean, I'm a, I'm a research guy and we, we do M&A on the side, so we spend a lot of our time looking at, well, what are the trends? What's, what's coming next for partners? But there's nothing quite like grounding kind of quantitative data with some qualitative interviews with partners to just go, what are you seeing? Because it can be different by region, by area, by industry. So love the community side of it. For, for me, it's kind of all about that and just being able to have that two-way conversation, not a one-way conversation, mm. right? So these are, I, I enjoy that most. It's not a one-way push of data. It's actually, what are you doing? You know, this is yeah. this is what we're seeing. What are you what are you seeing, Ross? Yeah, so yeah. Nice. love love that aspect of it. Yeah. How long have you been coming to the events for or been involved in the community? Uh IT Nation? Oh. Don't know. Long long time. Long time. Uh, long time. So a lot yeah. of that today, eh? Everyone's a long like it feels like there's not a lot of newbies. Yeah. Uh, then look, there's always new people coming, but it also does feel like a bit of a reunion every time you get yeah, together. Right. And, yeah. uh, um and I I think you know, it's come through in a couple of stages that that you know while we're competitors, you're also making friends. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's an interesting uh, community. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. Let's talk about um, best cases of AI adoption to drive real world business outcomes. We've been talking a lot today about uh, AI with various people, and and the challenge seems to be real world application. Um, what are you seeing done well to date? Yeah, I think what we're seeing done well is very few and far between. So we've obviously sort of unsurprisingly done mm -hmm. a ton of data. Uh, and a ton of research around AI and what people are doing with AI. And the biggest challenge we're seeing is it's probably the most specific technology that we've seen, which is without a specific use case, and even not necessarily by segment or by industry, but by individual customer, there are some themes. It's so specific, the challenge is it becomes then almost non-repeatable. Mm. So the biggest challenge we've seen, and we've got a ton of data that supports this, is lots and lots of proof of concepts because mm -hmm. customers started with i don't know the board said ai everyone's saying ai <laughs> my daughter downloaded chat gpt and now i've got to do something with ai so team runoff do something with ai yeah. Yeah. that usually constitutes a 10 or twenty thousand dollar proof of concept project with poorly written kpis mm -hmm. that doesn't translate into a project right so we're seeing tons of activity we're not seeing much of that translate into real projects. You know, traditional, traditional. you'd say you get a business analyst, you have a look at the business problem, the partners sit down and try and help you as a customer work that through. You build a business case for what that's going to be. And if the proof of concept passes it, it gets funding and becomes a project. We've broken that. Mm. So what, we, what we're getting is lots of, people doing, lots of people spinning up projects just to see what it is. So we're kind of in a test phase. Uh, the, t the top end of town very different. So very say, does, yeah, does that span or enterprise? Is no, it, enterprise it, completely different. So you know, enterprise you take some of the big banks. We we know one that's got a team of two hundred and forty people working on an AI project, and you go, they're all over it, but they can yeah. fund that. Yeah. As you come down the classic triangle, we're a mid market SMB economy. Uh, essentially, it gets harder and harder to fund those. But the interest level is there, and we're in this. You know, we we've been saying to partners for a while. It's just like you just got to get in the fight, get yeah. in the mix. Um, you know, you don't, you don't need to have all the answers. This is literally a journey of discovery for all but it, parties. But the need for there to be nearer term productivity benefits, nearer term revenue drivers becomes more real at that bottom end, right? It, it does. I mean, what we actually sort of, uh, when you break it down as well, we did look at uh, a whole series of the use cases and it breaks quite neatly into what we'd consider to be gross profit and net profit. So you can actually break the projects by, you know, are they gross profits? So are they revenue generating marketing, you know, are they generating new business and growth? Or are they net profit drivers, which is it's cost saving. We No one wants to talk about it, but let's talk about people. Let's yeah. talk about productivity. Uh, and we're seeing more of the projects erring that way to the kind of what we call the net profit side of the equation rather than the gross profit side of the equation. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think because it probably just looks like low hanging fruit. And I, I don't know if that's what you're seeing, Ross, as well, but it, it's kind of an easier business case to put together. You know, insert X, insert automation, 25% more productivity equals, you know, more productive staff or less staff. Yeah. And, and, uh, we were having this. We had our own event with our, our technical account managers this week, and it was a good conversation around this about how we're talking with it with the customers. And you know, the, you know, the um, if I can create X number of hours of savings per that sort of person, you know, that's not necessarily a therefore I'm saving them money, but I'm giving them time back to do something else. Yep. You know, it's very different from a we're going to put this straight to the bottom line and you know the, so the, the, how to have those conversations. But you touched on something before, which became a topic this week, which is are we expert enough to be talking about AI with our customers? And reality yeah. is we're about two weeks in front of them in terms yeah. of the learning, right? Because it is- Totally. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I guess 
are there AI experts? What is an AI expert today? Like, I mean, yeah. if you had one, you well, you couldn't have one because you couldn't afford them if there was such yeah. a thing in the first place, right? So, <laughs> outside of very few people in uh, probably in the US and in a few other enclaves, there aren't. Uh, you know, and yeah. we used to joke right in the in the tech industry about you just need to be one page ahead in the manual, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, <laughs> I was like that with drums. Say so one listen ahead of my daughter. You know, just, it's, exactly yeah. right. So, and then you and then you are an instant kind of genius. And I think with uh, a lot of parts, it sounds like you're doing the same thing, Ross. Which is it's this collaborative type of approach which is very much what the consulting houses have been doing for years, right? Which is, we've got some expertise, you know, so we're using it ourselves and messing around, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we understand you as a customer. We understand maybe a bit about your industry, and I think that industry lens is key. But then, you know what, we're going to work with you, you know, we'll put some BAs in and we're going to work through these, these concepts. This is, we're not pretending that we've got this, here you go, you know, do you want an AI? It's 99.99. We're just not in that world yet. Yeah. And I think that collaborative approach, if you've got that collaborative approach with your customers, you can kind of really start to get things going and learn to an extent along the way, right? Yeah. Part of me wonders that there's such a fear of missing out on this whole AI train and there's such a buzz around your business. Everyone feels like their business is, it should be able to do something with AI to drive productivity or better customer experience or something. I wonder whether that bias is actually leaving so many other easier, less complex wins or projects to the wayside, right? That there's only so much money or, or, or time to put into improvement projects and whether the things that probably were easier just aren't getting done because everyone's like, AI, I don't know. I've got no backup. I have um, no data to back no, that up. No, we, we, we've got the data. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so, okay. Please. You can always trust Tell them right. But when you, when you look at, you know, and let's be honest, right? AI is just the next injection into digital transformation. You can't. There's really no separation between those initiatives now. Yeah. The, the challenge that we've seen is funding sometimes being, well, the issue is there's not huge amounts of funding going into it. I think our latest research, AI in terms of priority, uh, which we're, actually we'll be covering off here at IT Nation actually, is number, I have to remember, it's number seven or number eight. Yeah. So it's still relatively low down, but it wasn't anywhere on the charts okay. in the last eight years. So it's kind of entered into the top 10 out of nowhere. But the danger we think is potentially people jumping into AI beyond experimental stage, but not doing some of the homework. So, you know, if you haven't got your security nailed, if you haven't yeah. got your data governance done, if you haven't done some hygiene factors around yeah. PII and adherence and even, then it's a very dangerous place to be. So you've really got to track what's happening in AI with the people putting the building blocks in place around their data structures and, the, and getting the hygiene factors right in order to have a safe kind of playground to do some stuff. So the, the risk we'd, we'd hate to see, and we, have, we haven't tracked this yet, is whether that funding is moving from building blocks that are essential to the fun stuff or what looks like the fun stuff on top. That's a very risky proposition. And from the lot of conversations I'm having with customers, what the, you know, AI, there's no clear bound on what that actually means. And so a lot of the conversations that people think they're having about AI, we're actually talking about automation. Yeah. Uh, and in a lot of ways, kind of back to what you're saying, in some ways, that's actually the immediate opportunity on the table today is that kind of, you know, that really taking automation to the next level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a term I think you use, hyper automation, hyper -automation as well. Yeah. Which, um, I, and we we would totally agree as well because ultimately it's about to an extent, you know, how do you make your business more successful, grow faster, you know, or more efficient? And some of that is just automation. Yeah. You know, you may be able to inject. Uh, and, and actually, when we talk to partners, they say, "Should I build an AI practice?" And I'm like, "Probably not." You can, what you can, well, one, I, I think you'd struggle to staff it. Yeah. Um, you know, what would that look so, like? First, tell me that. Yeah. yeah tell me yeah. That. what would that be? Yeah. Because, yeah. And, and then you go, well, actually, it's the better way to think about it is what business units do you have right now? What service offerings do you have right now? And what happens to those if you inject AI into them? So it's kind of like, you know, cyber with AI injected into it. Automation, if you're already doing it, with yeah. AI injected into yeah. automation is a much better way to think about it. Uh, and we do the same thing with security. We say, you can build a whole security practice if you're going to be a really dedicated cyber partner. But also, if you're doing anything else, you're doing modern workplace or backup or networking, then you still need to have cyber running horizontally yeah, doing uh, all across those, those anyway. First. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then you can decide separately to build an entire practice. And at the moment, AI for me is in that. Right. Think of it as in terms of all the offerings that you've currently got and what you do right now and inject AI into those components and think how that helps that particular It's cloud scenario. all over again, right? It's not something you yeah. sell in, in on its own. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. part of delivering something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah that's an interesting lens to put on it. I was just thinking, and again, this isn't a strength of mine that the, the cybersecurity piece and, and sort of end user vulnerability, but I do think that I know that, that one of the biggest risks currently for, for any business is the end user mistakes, right? Clicking on a link, doing this, doing that. But with end users probably embracing in fits and starts AI, whether that's Copilot, ChatGPT, or some other variants, individually and without it being part of a company policy or program, I assume that that must be introducing a whole new level of risk and, and probably... I'm sure there are you know, malactors 
out there looking for ways to exploit that, right? Yeah. Oh, look, let's go back, go back in time to the 90s, right? Remember when email became a thing and it was departmental email? So you had these kind of stalking technologies that came in and IT completely unaware of them, right? We used to call it shadow IT. Mm -hmm. You kind of go back far enough. We're doing that again, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to, and especially as the workforce is rotating, you've got this mix of the baby boomers are largely being pushed out. You've got a lot of Gen Xs generally in senior management positions, and then a mixture of sort of Gen Ys and millennials and Gen Zs. The younger generations are embracing this and pretty much already using it. Mm -hmm. So you've got this sort of slightly different demographic. So mm -hmm. we've got this very mixed workforce. And therefore, you've got different styles with perhaps the Gen X is not as willing to embrace it. So you actually need more training and education. And yeah. at the other end, you've got millennials who are using it. And you probably need to put some degree of governance around the top of that. So you've got this kind of almost like two or three speed thing happening inside most businesses. It's so funny to think of personas as an important thing in cybersecurity. <laughs> like who, yeah. how you protect a business will depend on how the user interacts with the tech. And that's yeah. going to vary because, yeah. 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 I mean, I talk a lot about the you know, this spectrum of, yeah, and and... IT often sits and cyber even more so in this, you know, the department of no, like we actually stop people doing stuff because yeah. of the, the risk and the, because we're worried about security and stability and resilience and, and we actually say no, but all that means is that it's like creates more and more of that shadow IT, right? Yeah. And so then you have this, so I call it a spectrum from the department of no out to the collection of cowboys on the other yeah, side, yeah, you know, yeah. which, and where do you sit on that, on that yeah. spectrum? And we, Sorry. Yeah, uh, no, I was going to say, and we, uh, we, we've been tracking for years, actually, for probably 10 or 12 years, the percentage of IT budget that's, that's held by IT, right. as opposed to being held by a line of business or by right. business yeah. or people. So that crossed the 50% mark four or five years ago, I want to say, which All is, right. you know, IT had less than half. Uh, that's now well below 35%. Uh, in most cases, it varies right. a little bit by segment and by industry, but broadly, IT is turning into this overall governance framework. You know, look after security and data, yeah. and and provide this kind of framework, and then allow the business units or people who have got the funding to then spin up whatever whatever they want to spin up, mm. but on top of a set of governance principles yeah, that yeah. make sure that you're adhered to whether yeah. it's Essential 8 or NIST or the cyber framework, yeah. your security stance, yeah, your PII I, stance, all those other yeah, components. identity management, all that kind of stuff. Identity. Yeah. So, yeah. so that that's kind of lending itself to actually these line of business units yeah. should be doing their own thing and investing in, and look at, and running up projects with you, Ross, on let's have a look at this automation thing. Yeah. But IT has yeah. got to make, make sure They've got all the other governance principles in place yeah. and everything else is in place. So you've got this kind of safe foundations for these people to, to go and do that. Yeah. When that's not in place, it gets really difficult. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry? Yeah. No. No, I, 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 <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I don't know how much longer we've got you for, uh, Michael. What are we thinking you've got? That's uh, 10 to 3. How much... Uh, I think I'll go for another five minutes. Go cool, great. Awesome. The AV guys will stress, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a big problem. That's fine. Uh, yeah, I was actually just going to say on that one that um, the more you have been the department of no from purely, uh, I guess, a CSAT perspective, the more you tell people they can't do, the more you enforce user behavior change, the more they think that you're a crap provider and they don't like the way you make them work. And so yeah. there's an the actual customer satisfaction result off the back of that. But in terms of security outcomes, in terms of best practice, that, that may well be what's required, but it's a... It's gone back and forth yeah. over the years. I mean, we used to have these, you know, hard clamp down SOEs and it was very yeah. structured. And then yeah. it went the other way and it's bring your own device for all. Yeah. Do your, every, and then it, now it's gone security and we've gone back and but putting kind of laying, layering kind of controls so that you can bring your own device. But the, and so it'll swing back and forth. But. That's a great analogy. Like, so if you work in tech long enough, we kind of go around in circles. Yeah. Right? So everything comes back around again if you wait yeah. long enough. Yeah. So, so for you at the moment, you know, if you're talking to MSPs at the IT Nation events uh, this week, what are you counseling them really uh, to, to do in this space at the moment? What is the opportunity or, or potentially the threat uh, in, in terms of AI, you know, in, through inaction or, or if they are going to act how? Um, yeah, I, I, I think everybody has to lean into this. It's like, you know, I don't think you can be a successful MSP without some degree of expertise in, in both AI and right. cyber. If you're not doing those two things, I think it's going to be very difficult to survive. And, okay. and the way I would approach that for, for most of the partners out there is you don't need to become an AI expert. But a lot of MSPs have kind of rotated very heavily to manage services and annuity revenue. They've, they've heard sure. that talk track for years. Yep. So everyone's done that quite well. But that doesn't always bring out the best innovation. So I think we've got, in, in some cases, not as much innovation happening in that space. And I think when we look at that segment, the price, if you, if you look at what we would call the kind of um, uh, the pricing waterfall and the way pricing waterfall is going to go for some of those core services around whether it's managed server, managed desktop, modern workplace, managed backup, um, the, the flight path for pricing on that is probably only heading in one direction. Customers want to free up budget to spend all these new sexy AI and, and spend more on cyber. That yeah. means they're going to squeeze costs out of managing existing infrastructure. So MSPs have really got to be leaning into how can you deliver that more efficiently, more cost effectively. And there's a lot of consolidation still happening. That's giving some people economies of scale. 
So I think there's a real margin squeeze that's it's been coming for a while, right? So, yeah, you know, it's I've been, certainly seen it's been that happening for a while. For a, a while. Yeah. We yeah. don't see that going away. When we track, you know, pricing waterfalls from, you know, with the, some people take man, classic modern workplace managed desktop, some people can do 150 bucks. We've seen deals at 45. So, so, you know, you need to figure out where you can be profitable based on the customer segments you serve. But we've got to start really looking at how we can use automation and these AI tools on our own internal to drive one, drive more profitability, but give us more room to move as we get pricing pressure. And then building these higher value, higher revenue, higher margin services uh, at the front end. And that's, let's be honest, that's always been the game in, in MSP land, right? You've got to be leaning into the new services where there's more margin yeah. and accepting that, you know, the, the more mature ones where there's more competition, you're going to get squeezed a little bit on margin, so you need to deliver them more efficiently. So I think more of that certainly over the next two to three years. Yeah, and I've said, like, I, I agree with what you said around, um, this annuity revenue, the, the recurring nature of, we've been told that that's what you have to do yeah. to be to be successful, uh, to the point where I know I'm talking to a lot of larger MSPs even out of the US and, and they're like, oh no, we don't really want to touch that consulting because it's professional services. Yeah. It's like, but that's actually what the customers are actually asking us for. And I think that where the MSP needs to move, uh, the challenge is it is coming back to a lot of consulting, yeah. uh, a lot of projects, um, not as much of that annuity revenue, but um, it, it does seem to be putting people off at the moment, and and I um, and that's being driven from the the value. I mean, you do a lot of work in valuations and that kind of stuff yeah. as well. But I, the comment I think literally had last week was, oh, no, the private equity don't like that, you know, because it's not it's not recurring. I was like, well. But yeah. that's what we need. That's what the customer wants. It, it's interesting, isn't it? And we check a lot of that data, as you know. So we've seen exactly the same thing, which is actually we've sort of lost that muscle for yeah. doing for doing really high end, for doing good good old fashioned consulting. Right? Yeah, we've sort of let that muscle sort of waste a little bit. Yeah, and we need to kind of beef that up at the gym again. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got to be staffing up there, but the margins will support that. Yeah, uh, certainly what we see. And when you let's look, take take a look at you know the big consultancy outfits of Accenture and KPMG and Deloitte and those guys. They're not managed services businesses. No. They're predominantly consulting business. They're highly profitable. Yes. You, look at, you look at Accenture's margin. Accenture's margin is better than almost every MSP that I know. No, no doubt. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you go, and that's based on you know billable hours and time and materials and rates and projects and scoping. So yeah. there's money to be made there. I think we have over rotated, and I think. Yeah. That, Building that muscle back up, we got to go to the consulting gym. And kind of beat that ask, up a little. Is that because it's one thing to have consultants; it's another thing to have consultancy expertise and the framework and the 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 pipeline yeah. management and all that kind of stuff. Is is that kind of the missing part? Uh, yeah, we we think. Um, and actually, I'll be I'll be talking about this uh, this afternoon. Is we we haven't traditionally as as MSPs, and this is a generalization, but we haven't hired a lot of that kind of business analyst style mm, role, yeah, which is very much people who are coming in and go, what is it? What are you trying to do? Yeah. And there's a framework and a methodology for approaching it. It's almost like the ideation stuff we used to yeah. do about four or five years yeah. ago. Whereas, you know, our idea of consulting was somebody with a bunch of certifications who's really smart, who can draw stuff on a whiteboard and then roll it out and get some implementation done. It's still infrastructure consulting, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of, yeah. It's, it's pre-sales. It's based up. on your specific <laughs> domain knowledge, yeah, yeah. as opposed to it's based on your skill set and running through a framework and methodology. Yeah, yeah to be able to spin out a project with the yeah. right KPIs and then know how to measure that and take a client through it and lead the right way. And that's a muscle that we don't see as much, mm. but I think it's a, a, a great muscle to, to build. We're gonna see a lot more of this, right? Mm. You know, the, the footprint of kind of standard tech stack, we're doing a lot more stuff in the future built on top of that that's gonna be kind of custom and specific by industry or by customer, and yeah. that needs a different approach to how you think about consulting. Mark, thank you Perfect. so much, and thank you for your Pleasure, time. You've run it very, very close to your to your presentation, but I really appreciate it. No worries, yeah. thanks, thank man. You. Thanks, Ross. Thank good to see you. Thanks, man. I'll give you a shake of the hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.